I am Al Hunt, and I am honored to have been invited to moderate this panel. Uh, I'm less than honored when I realized the reason was that I'm one of the very few people old enough to have been here uh, in 1974, but I guess it beats the alternative. Uh, as all of you know, in, in this room, uh, there was there are just a few events in your lifetime that uh, help shape, help form, uh, and are unforgettable. And certainly Watergate was at the very top of that list for anybody who lived through it. It was an extraordinary occasion. It was uh, uh, incredibly exhilarating. It was incredibly scary. It was uh, incredibly uncertain. It was incredibly, we talk about polarizing, we forget what polarization was like uh, back in those days, whether it was Watergate or Vietnam. Today we have, you, know, you have a whole bunch of panels. I will just say very quickly, I'll, I'll give a little plug for Common Cause, because I do remember back in 1973 and 74 that one of the real stalwarts in trying to get to the bottom and trying to push for transparency was John Gardner and his colleagues David Cohen and Fred Wertheimer and others at Common Cause. So they really did play a role in this. Okay. <clears throat> We have three uh, really ideally suited uh, panelists this morning because they cover, I think, the most important touchstones uh, of uh, Watergate. Uh, I, I will introduce them in chronological order of events back then. Uh, uh, the first, I guess, would be Jack Farrell because he's about to do a biography of Richard Nixon. Without Richard Nixon, there wouldn't have been a Watergate. So uh, uh, Jack uh, uh, is in the middle of a book who spent a lot of time in Yorba Linda, California. He can tell you about all the best 7-Elevens uh, and McDonald's in Yorba Linda these days, because that's where he spends a lot of his life doing a book, which is going to come out in a couple years, uh, an autobi uh, excuse me, a biography. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> an autobiography of Jack Farrell. I would read that. A biography of, uh, of Richard Nixon. He previously did uh, a terrific biography of, uh, of Thomas P. O'Neill. Uh, uh, Terry Lenzner is uh, one of the uh, uh, great uh, legal figures of this town. And back when he was a young man, he still is a relatively young man, but back when he was a really young man, he was an associate counsel to the Senate Watergate Committee, the famous Irvin Committee. Uh, which I think also all, we all can agree played uh, an exceptional and a unique and extraordinary role <coughs> in this story. And finally, Francis O'Brien, who was Peter Rodino's right-hand person on the House Committee on Judiciary, where uh, I think uh, the institution and some of the individuals rose to levels that um, not only inspired America, but I think uh, uh, set a model for uh, congressional behavior, which we rarely have achieved since. So on that, uh, we'll go and each are going to make about a five-minute opening uh, remark to set the table. Uh, I'll ask a few questions, and then we'll throw it open to you. And I think by agree prior agreement, we agree, Jack, you're going to go first? Yeah, we'll do it chronologically. The press came first, and then the Senate, and then the House. That's terrific. All right. <laughs> Mr. Farrell. John Aloysius Farrell. Um, uh, Bob Haldeman, I mean, the Nixon side didn't really get a lot of coverage this morning, so I wanted to open with a quote from uh, Bob Haldeman. It's more of a, uh, an ex, uh, explainer rather than an excuse. But he said at a, a conference like this about 25 years ago, uh, don't ever, no matter what facet of the Nixon presidency you consider, don't ever lose sight of Vietnam as the overriding factor in the first Nixon term. It overshadowed everything all the time in every discussion, in every decision, in every opportunity, and in every problem. And it's interesting to note now, when the median age of the country is 38, which means that half the people in the United States of America were born after Nixon left office, um, and we tend to see the 60s through this sort of uh, soft glow of the hippies in uh, Woodstock, and uh, uh, there was a movie uh, you can catch on HBO called uh, Peace, Love, and Misunderstanding with uh, Jane Fonda playing this wonderfully soft earth mama far from the radicalized actress who went to North Vietnam and posed with the uh, gunners and the anti-aircraft uh, guns. Um, so we, we tend to forget that the 60s and Watergate took place in this amazingly um, violent time. You had uh, uh, major race riots here in Washington, blocks away from where we are today, uh, in Detroit, in Newark, in Watts, uh, in Los Angeles. Um, you had massive protests, 750,000 people coming to Washington so that the Nixon White House had to be encircled by buses. I mean, they really had a, a feeling of siege in there. You had the 
of course, the Kennedy and the King assassinations. You had LBJ being dumped. And then you had Richard Nixon getting elected with 43 percent of the vote in 1968, the first president in over a century to come to Washington and find that both houses of Congress were being held by the opposing party. So I mean, we talk about polarization today, Alan. This was true, true polarization. And it extended to the bureaucracy, who play a major important role in the role of the press, and it extended to the press as well. The, the press was changing from um, o an older, uh, less professional, uh, less highly educated group um, to a bunch of uh, cocky uh, upstarts with uh, great educations and great wit and, and brains like Al. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, Where are the brains? Journalism was changing. Um, and uh, Washington, always a uh, forum for leaks, uh, was uh, in the first year, two years of the Nixon administration, just struck by some incredible leaks that would be huge stories today. Um, the United States secret bombing of Cambodia right after Nixon got into office. Um, the United States bargaining strategy for strategic arms talks with Russia was leaked. Um, the secret Pentagon uh, history of the war in Vietnam, the Pentagon Papers. Uh, and the U.S. tilt towards Pakistan in the uh, uh, India-Pakistan uh, War. Um, Nixon had great foreign policy ambitions, but they all required uh, secrecy. And moreover, because he was who he was, uh, he hated the press. Um, it had made him during the Cold War, um, but uh, it was, uh, again, it was, it was the, especially the New York est establishment press um, the Washington, and the Washington Post that, that, and the networks that he truly came um, to focus uh, against. Um, uh, and so almost as soon as he took office, with the first few leaks, um, he went out and began to bug newsmen. And he issued uh, 17 famous um, wiretaps, uh, four of which were newsmen. The other were members of the White House staff trying to crack down um, on uh, bugging. Uh, yeah. This uh, accelerated during the Pentagon Papers when he got into a major confrontation um, with the press um, over uh, the leak of the Pentagon Papers. They went to court. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court. Nixon lost. Um, it, a, a famous Nixon historian told me that he thinks that that summer uh, Nixon uh, had a nervous breakdown that, that none of us caught, um, and that led eventually to Watergate, uh, because when uh, the FBI refused to do uh, the kind of uh, investigations, the break-ins and the bugging that Nixon demanded, um, he went to his own private plumber's unit. Um, so there it happened, uh, and uh, before I go any further, I want to uh, really uh, give a tip of the hat to one of the great Washington Post journalists who, without him, nothing else would have happened, uh, Eugene Baczynski. You all know Eugene Baczynski. <laughs> Eugene Baczynski was the night cops reporter who uh, came across the notation W.H. Howard Hunt uh, in the uh, uh, address book of a white Watergate burglar, uh, gave it to Bob Woodward, and the first uh, Woodward byline is Woodward and Baczynski, not Woodward and Bernstein. But, um, and there were others besides uh, Woodward and, and Bernstein. Um, uh, the movie All the President's Men stands up incredibly well. Uh, and it's, if you really want to know what it was like in those first six months, uh, see the movie. It's, it, there's a little bit of condensation and, and, for, and drama added for Hollywood, but it is a remarkable historical document. Uh, given where we are with uh, the state of newspapers, it's probably the last great <coughs> newspaper movie as well. Um, but that's not to leave out the Los Angeles Times, which in October of 1972 came out um, with the first interview with one of the Washington, uh, uh, Watergate burglars, Alfred Baldwin. And then CBS uh, in uh, 1972 put on an amazing television show in, on the eve of the election, 14 minutes out of a 22-minute show uh, on Watergate. And uh, it was said that afterwards that uh, Catherine Graham went up to uh, uh, Bill Paley and threw her arms around him and said, you saved us, because even though there was not much new in the CBS broadcast, it was a validation uh, for, for Woodward and Bernstein that what they were doing and what the Post was doing um, was correct. Uh, and then finally, in uh, January of 1973, uh, Cy Hirsch dragged the New York Times kicking and screaming into the story. And again, that validated um, the, this uh, investigation and this process in a way. And maybe we can talk a little bit later about uh, why the Times was, uh, and, and an awful lot of mainstream older reporters uh, were so reluctant to get, it, uh, to get into this. One final word about um, the, the man who, that we can talk about now, Deep Throat. Um, was a real person. We know now that he was Mark Felt, the number two man at the FBI. 
and, uh, and, and felt was a very unique character. He was motivated in a large part because he wanted to be a director, and Nixon didn't <clears throat> name him, so he had um, an axe to grind. But he also didn't like what Nixon and, and was doing to uh, his beloved FBI. And here again, you have this, the bureaucracy combining with the press to uh, undermine Nixon. But Felt was no, no liberal. One of the great sto untold stories of Watergate is that after Watergate happened, Felt was prosecuted um, uh, by, the, by the federal government for uh, staging his own break-ins, his own Watergate-type uh, burglaries of relatives of the uh, weathermen, because uh, as a national security uh, matter, uh, the weathermen were making bombs, and, and uh, Felt authorized uh, his teams to go in and, and plant um, bugs to try to find out where the, uh, with the re weatherman suspect's relatives to try to find out where they might be uh, hiding out. So he was prosecuted for this, and the witness, the only time he appeared on, a, on, on the stand and, and swore an oath was Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon came in and testified on behalf of Mark Felt, saying that um, th this was justified in times of war and, and pounding the, the uh, rail in front of him for emphasis, saying that when the president decides as a matter of national security this is important, uh, then the laws do not apply. Um, Felt was unsurprisingly convicted anyway, um, but upon uh, Ronald Reagan's election, Ronald Reagan pardoned him. And Nixon sent Felt a bottle of champagne, still having a suspicion that Mark Felt was deep throat, but not knowing entirely, um, uh, with the uh, little notation on the card that said, justice ultimately prevails. <laughs> <laughs> What a great story. Uh, Terry? Yes, well, um, <clears throat> let me start by saying uh, I wanted to uh, honor a... Oh, I, nope. yeah. I wanted to honor, uh, before I uh, stop, um, a, a unique uh, superhero of mine, and I talked to Francis about how he became the head of the House Judiciary Committee before we had this a very interesting story, uh, and that's John Doerr, who I worked with in Mississippi and Alabama, and who was the father of the, uh, of the work we did in the Mississippi burning murder case, as well as the Selma to Montgomery march and the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which actually revolutionized um, uh, the s society in the South and gave the vote to minority people. Uh, he can't be here today, but uh, Francis knows. I congratulate Francis on having the wisdom <laughs> and, and, and uh, thoughtfulness of, of bringing him into the House impeachment inquiry. And Francis may tell you the whole story after, uh, after a bit here. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, remind a, a significant event that went completely unheralded in March of 1969 when John Ehrlichman flew to uh, LaGuardia Airport to meet with Jack Caulfield uh, to set up the Get the Enemies of Nixon group, which later expanded to uh, uh, Tony Laswitz as well. Um, so they, the, the members of the White House had hardly moved into the, to their offices in that period, and they had already set up basically a secret organization funded with secret funds to uh, have uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, burglars uh, and other uh, miscreants uh, funded going into the future. And that was an a, uh, incredible early uh, signal that the Nixon administration was going down the wrong uh, road to, uh, to, to the end and, go, and starting, actually, literally, Watergate. Um, out of that uh, meeting in New York came uh, I'll, I'll name some, some operatives, Gemstone, Ruby One, Ruby Two, Sedan Chair, Chapman's Friends, and others, all of whom were designated to work for Donald Segretti in the Dirty Tricks campaign, which was targeted to uh, uh, beat Ed Muskie, who was the favorite Democratic candidate at the time. They infiltrated his campaign. They stole documents from his office. They. Uh, they, they s disseminated material that was libelous and uh, about uh, Jackson and about uh, Jackson and uh, Muskie, and uh, they sowed, uh, tried to sow dissension within the ranks of all the campaign headquarters uh, during that time. And the reason I raise that is because 
from my uh, view of that in the investigation we did, I thought that was, frankly, the most significant effect to uh, destroy the democracy completely by, <clears throat> by deciding there was some money, hidden money, uh, used to, uh, to try to take down the leading Democratic candidate, uh, had potential in it that probably is unlimited in the days now of Citizens United. With that kind of money, you can do an awful, awfully effective job of destroying the chosen candidate. It was a diabolical scheme. It was a very smart <coughs> scheme, uh, probably uh, 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 authored by uh, Pat Buchanan and others. But um, we don't have, I don't think yet, a law that prohibits the interference by one party of another party's activities attempting to affect the uh, outcome of the opposite party's <clears throat> campaigns. It's, a, it's an incredibly ingenious tactic because if it works, you can, your, your national election becomes uh, less expensive, uh, your candidate may become uh, a weakened candidate, a la George McGovern, and, and Muskie ultimately did retire and resign from the campaign. Uh, <clears throat> And, and one of the reasons was, because of all these activities that were going on, uh, got to him, and he, he was not prepared, unfortunately, for it. Um, but that, to me, still, uh, still uh, is one of the biggest threats to, uh, I think, the democratic process. The infiltrations of all these campaigns was financed by Creep and by the White House, obviously with, with uh, funds not disclosed. Um, the other thing I would mention is, uh, quickly, um, the significance of, of uh, TV in the hearings. The, the existence of TV, to me, was a huge revolution. It created a nationwide participation in a, uh, in a uh, quiz show, because we got, we got thousands of letters, telegrams, uh, calls at night suggesting questions for the Attorney General to answer. And, and uh, I thought it was extremely healthy because a lot of people actually felt that they were participating in questioning the senior leaders of the government. And I thought that was a, a very interesting sidebar on, uh, and a very productive one. And it, in fact, we did have people looking at those questions and going through them and seeing if there's anything uh, that would be productive to you. So, uh, that, to me, was also an important factor. I uh, just leave last word. Um, uh, in addition to those kinds of communications, I was ex extremely upset about leaks uh, from uh, senators or members of the staff uh, because, uh, for, as an investigator, I was concerned that it was going to hurt our, uh, uh, our investigation because it would get out. People knew what we were asking, what we were looking for. And it would preempt a lot of what surprises that we would have liked to have had with potential witnesses. And uh, I actually confronted uh, Senator Weicker at one point and said, well, you can't continue to leak this stuff because it's hurting our investigation. <clears throat> and the first thing he said was, he's a very tall man, you might remember. He stood up, towered over me, and said, who elected you to the Senate? <laughs> and I said, that's a good question, actually. And uh, he then convinced me that his leaking was keeping the country educated about what was going on. If, if the country was not educated and something happened like the Saturday Night Massacre, firing the special prosecutor, the public may not be aware of the importance of that kind of an activity. So I, on hindsight, I decided that I was wrong and Senator White was right. My turn. Um, a couple of things. One is I want to give a uh, nod to Common Cause for a kind of an odd reason. Um, during our time on the, um, that I worked for the committee, uh, I mean, for Congressman Rodino, uh, John Gardner, David Cohen, and others pressed us very hard to make sure that we were going to do the job that we were uh, assigned to do. Interesting that John Gardner, when it ended, became a key mentor to me on, and gave me the courage to sort of go and do something else in my life. And those who know me, I just left Washington right after that. And, and moved to California, but it was because of John Gardner saying that, you know, we could do anything we wanted to do. And uh, I thought all these years later, 
uh, I never got the chance to thank him and uh, for David Cohen. Now, I want to talk a little about the accidents of history. And we all think now that we read back after 40 years, we read history books, how you know this Rodino Committee came about. The, before we get to the Rodino Committee, we have to talk about this young, sort of irritating young lady out of Brooklyn who decides that she, that she of all people and her staff, could actually run against one of the lines of Congress, Manny Seller. So here's this young lady, runs against Manny Seller, who had been in Congress for 50 years, and what does she do? She beats Manny Seller. And of course, she's sitting here somewhere in this room, I'm sure, and it's Liz Holtzman. Um, and, and a big shout out to, to her. And her very irritating staff, Marilyn Shapiro, I'm sure, is in this room also, <laughs> and some of you know. And, and we didn't know, and of course, at the time, we thought, boy, isn't this great youth and all that? We had no idea that she'd wind up on our committee irritating us. But, uh, <laughs> but again, that's uh, a, uh, a large part of this, sort of the accidents of history. It's how Peter Rodino became the chairman. Um, and I think that needs to be acknowledged and realized history is not a neat, um, uh, a neat experience. One other story, because Terry brought it up, and then I'll talk a little about the committee, is how John Doerr, who many of you know here, is a true American hero and still lives in New York, um, but never talks about these days or anything else much. Um, it's his style. Um, Peter Rodino was brand new as chairman and untested. Um, I was living in New York, um, and through a very serious interview process, uh, I was chosen as the chief of staff. And that I answered the right question, even though my name is Francis O'Brien, I'm actually Italian. Um, and, um, and I'm actually not kidding. <laughs> Either that I'm Italian or that's the reason he chose me. So I had never been to Washington, D.C., knew nothing about anything. Uh, the decision was made, and we can go through the reasons why, uh, the chairman decided that uh, a separate staff was going to be formed, and that separate staff would have a chief counsel. So he calls me. To, I can still remember this very day vividly. It was in the Rayburn building. There was, I sat next to him in the next office, and he calls me in. And those who remember uh, the chairman, you really I never understood what he was saying. Um, he talked very cryptically, and I least of all knew what he was saying. But I do remember this. He turned to me and said, um, we're going to need a, a general counsel. So I said, that's good. I mean, I'm, f I'm for that. <laughs> and he said, um, Okay, he says, let me know when we have one. <laughs> so I walked back to my office, actually shaking. There's a lot of shaking. And I said, oh my God. I said, I don't even know any lawyers, okay? And I didn't know what to do. I was, I, I was panic stricken. And a few people in the room, I called the only person in the world I trusted, and that's my brother, John, who was living in New York at the time. And I said, guess what the chairman just said? He said, pick, find a general counsel. So I said, how do we do that? So he said, I don't know. So he said, let's, this, now all you lawyers, don't get upset now. He said, he said, let's, he figures, let's, let's get, there's a law, there's law books. He said, and get, we'll get all these law schools and I'll divide, we'll divide the country up. And you call half of them in the East and you, I'll call them half in the West. And so, Sure enough, people like Mike Sovereign, so we took the list, and the hope was, and we drew up a little sort of a, kind of a description of what we were looking for. It was like a Joe Walsh kind, for those who remember, Joe Walsh, you know, hopefully Republican, nonpartisan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we went through the law books, and we called all these deans, and hopefully, hopefully they would come up with it. They didn't. So finally, my brother, who had actually worked for Bob Kennedy, said, you know, there was somebody who was just had this incredible reputation named John Doerr. And of course, there was no internet, so I didn't know how to spell Doerr. So it took me days to find him, but a very long story short. <laughs> long story short, he was out in Brooklyn, speaking of Liz Holtzman, at the time, something called the Bedford Stuyvesant Corporation. And he came down for an interview. And I can't believe that I actually interviewed him because, I mean, this was beyond my scope. But when he walked in the room, you knew. The chairman knew, and everyone else knew, this, this was a special human being. And that's how he was chosen um, 
And I know that's not the way history should be written, but that's the way it happened. Um, I'll talk as my time is up telling uh, stupid stories about myself, that um, the press played an incredibly important role for us. Um, and the reason is because the chairman, though he didn't actually say this specifically, he said, look, for this process to work, at the end of the day, when this is all done, he said the American public must believe that this was a fair undertaking. And he said so, and he was just on that issue all the time throughout the hearing. In fact, he was so particular that we were never even allowed to call the president by his last name. We could never say Nixon. It ought to be because the respect of the office had to be President Nixon um, or Richard Nixon, but deep respect for the presidency. He told the committee the same thing. We must come to a conclusion. Either <coughs> high crimes and misdemeanors were committed or not, but the American public must think this was a fair undertaking. And this, this was the rule that we all went out. And I think the staff, the committee members, um, took that very seriously. And I think he set the tone for that. And for that, I'll turn it back to uh, for Al. So much to ask. Uh, we want to touch on this question that's the, that's the um, centerpiece of what you're trying to do over two days, which is the accountability. Um, you know, I'm going to ask all three of you, and then I have particular questions. Um, one, of the, one of the lessons we supposedly learned uh, back then uh, had to do with accountability, with the abuse of power, with the need for transparency. And here we are 40 years later, and Terry cited Citizens United. Um, whatever your view on drones, anyone who read that Justice Department <coughs> memo that could have been written by Richard Nixon's mm -hmm. people, um, have we just forgotten those lessons or am I exaggerating? Anybody? Start. Well, you're not exaggerating. Uh, we have forgotten, and uh, if you ask uh, John McCain, for example, why there's not um, a similar kind of move towards uh, reform, towards getting the dark money out of politics, he'll tell you that we're waiting for another Watergate size scandal, and that's the only way it'll happen. Terry, what did you think of that Justice Department memo on, uh, on killing American citizens? Well, I, I, uh, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, sorry, I'm, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, I think the problem with it is <coughs> it sets uh, a precedent that can go, can be unlimited in terms of its expansion. Uh, and I don't see any visible control over it. If you can do things covertly, uh, as is done with these drones, uh, they can be used uh, to target enemies of the of the of the politics, of the politics. But, but, but apart from use of drones, uh, I guess the question I'm going to does it say that if the president says it's, it can be done, it can be done, which is really the, the, the nub of what Nixon that's said. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. It's, that's, the precedent is, is Nixon unilaterally making decisions, in this case, um, to kill uh, people. And I thought, I always thought we had, <coughs> because of the assassination attempts, uh, the church committee brought out some years ago that we had some legislation that prohibited us from uh, assassinating people in foreign countries, which obviously should include, if that's correct, if that's a viable, uh, that, that's still viable and you know, operative, um, it should certainly inhibit the government from, from killing the, the, the citizens of the United States as well as foreigners. Francis, any thoughts? Uh, a, I didn't read the memo, um, so I can't comment on that. Um, I just think that, uh, you know, again, this is about Watergate and this is about impeachment. I think, I think uh, the founders put high crimes and misdemeanors in the Constitution, that y the level of, uh, of crime that has to be committed, the standard has to be extraordinarily high. But I heard some of the previous conversations this morning, I don't think I don't think the president is above the law on any front. And I think, I think it's, it, it's the courage of the keepers of that Constitution, the members of Congress, 
that have to meet that standard. So I don't think the Cambodia issue, I think uh, Congresswoman Holtzman talked about that before. I don't think that swayed history one way or another. The pre it gave it the president a right. That's the, those who interpret that, uh, and that's the way the founders had it, the, those who interpret the Constitution, high crimes and misdemeanor, I think the, a president is not above any law. So it, it's, up, it's up to the modern members who sit in, in, in those positions to make that judgment. But I, I, and again, I, I would disagree that the Cambodia resolution or anything else uh, changed history. How, can, uh, I just, can I just add yeah. one thing? There's a very odd part of uh, our investigation. We were investigating uh, cash money that was, was given by uh, Howard Hughes to Bibi Verbozo to take care of some of the president's uh, bills and, and keep his gain. And one of the things we came up with at the end of the investigation was um, a meeting that took place that involved Howard Hughes's people and <coughs> Uh, Johnny Roselli and Sam Giacano, two organized crime people, who had been brought in by the Hughes people to assassinate Castro. And I, uh, I subpoenaed the two organized crime guys, and they took the national security exemption. <laughs> so, so I went to Irvin with a big memo, and I said, you, Mr. Senator, Mr. Chairman, you, will you n need to direct these people to answer my questions? because they don't have national security exemption. There's no such thing for convicted organized crime people. <laughs> and so I gave him this big memo, and he said, this is really interesting, but we're getting close to the end of our tenure, and I don't think the country needs another revelation about an, ass an assassination attempt. And so we didn't pursue it after that. But that was a sort of a casual, you know, non-government uh, discussion which the government was supporting, um, but it was all covert. Let me, let me pick up on, I, I always thought, wh whatever the wisdom of that, that last decision, that one of the geniuses of Mike Mansfield was picking Sam Irvin to head that committee. That, that it was a, it's easy to sit, sit back now and say it was all predestined. It wasn't predestined no. in 1973. And to pick a conservative, constitutional, courtly, Southern Democrat uh, who probably gave the White House more fits than they ever imagined. Mm -hmm. Give us a little bit of the dynamics of Irvin Baker and that committee. Well, I think, first of all, Irvin, you may remember, <coughs> uh, made an announcement before the committee was formed saying, I'm not going to have any presidential candidates on this committee, which is brilliant because it took out a lot of the partisanship that would have occurred had there been discussions and conflicts with Republicans and Democrats. So that was the first thing he did, which, which was brilliant. The second thing he did was he and Baker were friends, and, which, is, which is hard to find these days in, in, the, in this city. And they worked together. Don't forget, Baker was the one that said, what did the president know and when did he know it? That was a, a lot of what we did was, was, was cooperative, was nonpartisan, was sharing information, working with uh, 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 Fred Thompson and, and his people, and it was a completely different environment than it is now. Uh, we, you couldn't have a Watergate hearing like we did in this atmosphere now. It's, it would not be possible. And we, we, every vote was a unanimous vote, even if people objected to the, to the, to the thing that was being um, voted on, everybody still voted unanimously. At the end of the day, we didn't have a non-unanimous non vote including I had subpoenas on uh, Rosemary Woods, Don Nixon, Ed Nixon. I spent two and a half days with Don and Ed Nixon, which was not a picnic, uh, in a hotel room at LAX, and to see if uh, they would admit to getting the money from Howard Hughes that uh, went to Rebozo, uh, because Kalmbach had told us that that's where the money went. Um, and again, both sides uh, agreed to let me subpoena uh, the president's brothers, um, and uh, and question them for two two days of peace. So I don't think that could happen today. Yeah, I agree. Jack, what was the white? What was Nixon's view of Irvin and that committee in the beginning, and did it evolve and did it change? It, it evolved because at the at the beginning they totally underestimated 
And and the irony here is that Bob Haldeman came from J. Walter Thompson, uh, and some of the, I think Ziegler may have come from the, um, uh, Madison Avenue as well. So these were real madmen. And they thought that packaging was everything, and Nixon had been superbly packaged in the 68 campaign. And when they heard that it was going to be this fat, old, North Carolinian senator, well, they licked their chops. They just thought that there was no way that, that uh, he could do it. And they, and they learned this tremendous lesson about genuineness on television. Right, right. Which leads us to Peter Rodino. Um, Francis, that, that, again, that committee was not, it was hardly a foregone conclusion, and it was the work, as you cited earlier, of John Doerr. But talk a little bit, too, about the dynamics of that committee. You had those three Southern Democrats who no one quite knew what they would do, Thornton and uh, Flowers and Mann, and then you had a kind of a handful of critical Republicans, too. Well, a, a couple of things. One, it goes to the question about Sam Irvin. Uh, there was a lot of resistance initially when, uh, as we just said, uh, Rodino had just become chairman after Manny Seller was, uh, was this giant in, in, in the House. And there was a lot of skepticism uh, about Peter uh, that, uh, first of all, he was unknown, uh, you know, just a regular, a regular Democrat out of, uh, out of Newark. Um, that was he strong, he had made no name for himself, uh, voted party line, and he was Italian. And so th those were tough issues, and Jack can talk more to this. And then the question is, should this be a special committee, or should it go through regular order? And that was a big discussion uh, as, as they decided to go forward with an investigation. They decided to keep it within the Judiciary Committee. Um, and I think the, I think a person who was instrumental in this was the majority leader, uh, Tip O'Neill. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, it there's a close relationship. Peter had been in Congress for many many years. They knew each other. They trusted, and I think it was uh, it was uh, Majority Leader O'Neill's sort of strong influence here that kept it uh, in the Judiciary Committee uh, and with uh, Rudino as the head of it. The as to as I said at the beginning, Rudino felt. This had to be perceived in the public as a fair uh, undertaking, no matter, and and he truly did not know himself at the beginning, and and Liz Holzman was right when she said before, Rodino did not want to do this. This was not something he wanted to do. Uh, he thought it was the last thing. Any, I mean, he had such reverence for the presidency. He thought impeachment should be the very, very last thing. So he had to be pushed pretty hard to get to that point to to get going. But he did say once it started then this had to be a fair hearing. And he said, I remember we'd spend every night together, he and John Doerr and us, and he'd say, look, this is going to be decided by a group of individuals one way or another. And they said, he said, there's going to be people who will never, ever vote against the president. There, will be, there are people on this committee who would vote today for Arg's impeachment. And he says, I don't blame either side of that. He says, but what's going to be key would be these, this swath in the middle, both Democrats and Republicans, and I think he went out of his way over the over the time. This is in the days when when uh, par, uh, chairman and committee were very powerful. But he went out of his way to reach out to all of these individuals who he thought would be key to make sure they had access to um, to to answer the questions, uh, to you know, to be informed about what the committee, uh, what the staff was doing, et cetera, et cetera, because he understood their importance. He understood this was going to be hard choices they, down the line. Uh, there was uh, on there was um, flowers from um, Alabama. He was key. There was uh, Charles Mann, James, uh, James Mann from uh, one of the Carolinas. Charles uh, Mann played for the Redskins. Did he? <laughs> <laughs> um, there was. Um, well, Ray Thornton was the other. Was Ray, Ray the Thornton. He was but who were some of the key Repo who, who among the Republicans that you think were, were, were open-minded to begin with? We didn't know. I mean, you didn't know. We just knew. We knew Mr. Sandman from New Jersey wasn't. So I mean, there was there would be people like that. So we knew that. And as far as Rodino was concerned, everyone else was essentially, you know, open-minded to uh, to the investigation. So we didn't. From a staff point of view, for, or for the things he had me do, uh, in terms of keeping communication, which were not part of any public story, uh, but they're all at the archives, all the stuff we did. But 
um, he thought everyone except the few would be uh, would be would would try to render a fair uh, uh, a fair vote. Jack. Now that she's retired from politics, can you give us a couple of good Hillary stories from her days on the uh, impeachment staff? No. <laughs> Spoken like a good staff person. Let me ask you. Let me ask you all one question, and we'll open it up to everybody here. Uh, I think anyone who looks at the record uh, will see that uh, what started off as an investigation of a burglary uh, ended up with a whole panorama of high crimes and misdemeanors. Do you all think there's anything that Richard Nixon could have done early in this process that would have prevented uh, the opening of all of the horrors that we later discovered? Well, I thought that one thing he could do would be to pr try to preempt the, the committee. It would have been a risk. But if he had come up voluntarily to respond to questions from the senators, uh, he might have diffused the whole thing because we didn't know what questions to ask at that point. And there were pe senators trying to move us to a quick uh, hearing, <clears throat> putting on the most important uh, people, Mitchell, uh, Magruder. So if, if they had adopted, if the Irvin and Baker had adopted that strategy and said, let's go ahead and do it, uh, we would have been up the creek uh, because we didn't have enough time to, to study. We had a huge amount of information to abs absorb. And we, we had these witness trees that we created to, to talk to people at all kinds of levels, but we had barely gotten started on, on that particular process. So that was the only way I could see that, on hindsight, that he could have, uh, he might have uh, solidified his support by voluntarily coming up. Obviously, he would have lied, but uh, we may not have been able, been able to prove that at that stage. Jack? Yeah, I, I think he could have at several points, except and if you listen to the tapes, he always comes back to the Ellsberg break-in, which is that, yeah, we can, you know, we can cut things off at Magruder. We can, the president can go out, and and they talked about this in June of '72, um, the modified limout hangout road, all different times where he could have cut his losses. But it all came back to, once you get back into those guys who also did the break-in into Dr. Fielding's office, uh, which was really uh, atrocious as an invasion of civil rights and personal privacy, um, you opened up what John Mitchell called the horrors. And so it was, he never really So if you option. sold them out, they would sell you out on that? Yeah, 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 right. Let's open this up to questions here. I'm sure lots of people have questions. Uh, uh, do we have anybody with microphones? If not, I'll repeat the question. People can't hear it. Right there. Did anybody hear the question over there yeah. about yeah. the media? I, I would just, uh, I'm going to turn it to the panel. Uh, I would um, give you a, a uh, fascinating bit of information. Eric Holder has indicted more and prosecuted more reporters for leaks than Ed Meese, John Ashcroft, uh, and John Mitchell combined. Not, not reporters, but people leak. Reporters. Reporters. Actually, reporters.
<laughs> I'm the moderator. I'm going to turn. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, any thoughts? Any thoughts, Jack? Everybody turns to me. Um, I thought it was, first of all, I thought it was really interesting in the first session to hear Daniel Ellsberg praise Rand Paul for the filibuster on the floor. Uh, that, that kind of stuff, you know, at American politics, when you go all the way out to the right and left, you get out to the libertarians and then they, they sort of come around together on the other side. Um, and that kind of stuff could promote things. Um, it's, it's very, I mean, as, as difficult as it was to prod institutions like the New York Times and, the CB, and CBS News in, during the Watergate days, um, it's also very difficult in these days when everything is so fragmented and there's a thousand flowers blooming um, uh, to get any kind of strategy. And maybe this is maybe this is is good. So you know things that will pop up on the internet. Um, some of them are treated as stupid rumors. Some of them are plants. Some of them are hoaxes. Um, and 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 we really don't know at, at this point how it's um, going to come out uh, down the road. We can just sort of hope that the the framers <coughs> had it right in envisioning that. As long as everybody chatters, it'll be okay. Over there. Well, comparing the press now and then, I mean, even if you leave out the post 9 11 factor as, as a deterrent to, to the press doing certain things, to go back to something I brought up in the earlier session, what about in the 80s, 10 years after Watergate? To my mind, the mainstream show anything like the kind of zeal uh, to, to push as far as you could go with Iran Contra even as they had with Watergate. And, and there was no 9-11 in, in, in the picture at that point. Yeah, I think that Congresswoman Holtzman had a great answer for that, which is that the, the personality of this odd duck, Richard Nixon, who was number one on every lefty's liberal list, the number one on the press enemies list, um, versus um, the smooth-talking Ronald Reagan in Iran Contra or the very popular twice elected George W. Bush or Barack Obama uh, could explain an awful lot of that. The press is very respectful, I think, of public opinion when it chooses its targets. I, I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you one, just one great anecdote, though, about uh, I was running the Wall Street Journal Bureau back then, <clears throat> and a fabulous reporter named David Rogers did break the story about the CIA being behind the mining of the harbors of Managua, which was, <clears throat> which was illegal. And there is this sense that I think that grew out of Watergate, and I have you know just unlimited respect for Bob and Carl, but that somehow you find a deep throat or someone goes to a garage, and that's the way reporters get stories. The way David Rogers got that story, there was an, there was an all-night Senate session. And it was, a, it was about intelligence, and Barry Goldwater was furious. He also had had a few drinks, uh, and he lit into Bill Casey and talked about this act, that uh, this dastardly act, and nobody knew quite what it was. And David Rogers, being the most conscientious reporter, former colleague of Jack's, was the only reporter in the gallery at four o'clock in the morning. Immediately stayed up all night, went at nine o'clock the next morning to get the congressional record, and saw it was all excised. That hardly ever happens. That is so rare. And David realized there was a big story there someday. Two days later, he broke the, the story, and the Wall Street Journal had a slightly different style back then. I was traveling. They buried the story on page six, which was not, did not make me terribly happy. And the next day, the New York Times picked up the story, ran it front page, right-hand column, of course, no credit. And uh, the day after that, our, our editorial page, which was not always in sync with the news pages, <laughs> did a did a editorial blasting Edward Boland, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, for leaking the story to the New York Times. At which point, Eddie Boland, with the help of Kirk O'Donnell, wrote a wonderful letter to the editors of the Wall Street Journal editorial page, saying, "You really ought to read your own newspaper every now and then." <laughs> so, I want to make one comment about. And I haven't dealt with the press in 25 years, but I can tell you at the time. Great, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the time, I had never, never met a press person until I came to Washington D.C. until uh, I took this job. But I, in retrospect, there were some extraordinary people uh, who occupied, the, you know, the press. I think of the depth. Again, I didn't know. I, I was telling Jack before. Never mind New York Times, Wall Street Journal, who were, you know, they had depth. But you take the LA Times, they had a bureau that was just extraordinary. Boston Globe, I mean, reporter after reporter. I just was just amazed um, of the quality of people. I mean, 
I wouldn't have said that at the time because they were, you know, they were on you. And I, you know, I think of uh, Jack Nelson uh, of the L.A. Times. Uh, I think of Bill Kovitch from the New York Times and other people like that. And these, but also these are reporters who came. A lot of them who covered the civil rights, um, who had gone south with John Doerr and these other people, and they were just very courageous um, individuals. And uh, I just think the quality was was extraordinary. And I know when you dealt with, for those who know Jack Nelson, I was telling a story. I, I think of that story today with the Bob Woodward thing about some some he's upset about something. But I think Jack Nelson used to come to my office, you know, two three times a week. And if you know Jack, he'd look at you. And, and he'd say, um, if I see something in the Wall Street Journal that's not in the LA Times, he said, you're not going to live long. <laughs> now, 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 I never thought that was personal because, because I'm Italian. That's the way my mother talked. So, but it just, it, but it just, I mean, you, you know, these were tough reporters. You didn't mess with them and we had great respect for them. But that's in retrospect at the time, you know, uh, Jim Wehart from the Daily News and et cetera, et cetera. But I, I don't know, I can't judge today, um, uh, Al, but I know there were some extraordinary people at my, uh, manning the, uh, the bureaus at the time. Hi, I'm Alicia Shepard, and I wrote a book, Woodward and Bernstein, Life in the Shadow of Watergate, and I have a whole chapter on the media. And what's one of the irons, ironies of the time was that Jack Nelson and the other two guys whose names worked on this Watergate story were 10 years older than Woodward and Bernstein. They had families, and Woodward and Bernstein were both recently divorced. And just, you know, and Jack told me, I <coughs> wanted that story, but uh, he did not, you know, have the time yet to play, pay attention to his family. And, um, but Terry, I want to ask you a quick question. Uh, to me, one of the unsung heroes of Watergate who came up before is Alexander Butterfield. He's probably in the other room. Um, <laughs> But uh, there seems to be a dispute about, you know, when the uh, pre-interview of him on Friday, July 13th, 1973, about who actually asked the question, was there any other taping system? Now, Scott Armstrong will say he did, and I know the, the Republican side said they did. Do you remember? Well, I, <coughs> when I, I was not present uh, at that, but what I was advised by the people who were that we actually decided <coughs> that the um, so one of the senior investigators for uh, how for Baker's operation uh, was actually chosen to ask that question because he had asked it. I think he asked it in the informal presentation, and then based on that, and because uh, Baker and and Irvin got along so well, we we decided to cede that to. Uh, he was a, a former FBI guy that worked for uh, Baker's. I can't remember his name now, but so that's that's my understanding of what occurred. Uh, Jack, can you give us any idea of why uh, they did break into uh, O'Brien's office? It seems to me, uh, other than the question about Butterfield, that's one of the remaining questions about Watergate. Do I respond to that? My name is Alan Galbraith. Uh, I worked for Ed Williams and Joe Calacano in connection with the civil suit. Uh, I was dispatched to interview Baldwin in August of that year. I'm the one that, uh, that uh, told Spencer Oliver that it, the two phones was actually monitored. It's important to remember that they were going back in to, uh, to, to, uh, to fix a bug that wasn't working on Larry O'Brien's phone, plus uh, uh, install further eavesdropping. But my sense of it was at the time, and my sense of it after talking to Spencer, uh, what, just what Terry said, uh, that they were anxious to interrupt the political process uh, and do what they could uh, to put uh, McGovern in a position to win the nomination mm -hmm. uh, uh, because they felt he was uh, the weakest candidate. Now, I come from but, Alan, that was in June of 72. By then, it was pretty clear that McGovern was probably going to be the nominee. Well, but the initial break-in was in May. They were going back to fix mm -hmm. uh, the bug, and the, among other things, the Texas Convention had not occurred uh, in June. It was coming up later, and that was going to be an important convention. So that was the sense at the time. It was, And, and we found out uh, from Baldwin as well uh, that there had been an effort, a failed effort, to uh, break into McGovern's headquarters. Right. Uh, but it was the sense uh, that it was real interruption of the political process uh, 
by the Republicans in a very dirty way. Uh, and to me, uh, that also makes this uh, uh, as horrible as uh, Iran Contra was. It also distinguishes Watergate from Iran Contra because here you have an event that's going right to the very heart of our domestic political system. No, I agree with that completely. And uh, I would just add um, that uh, they, were, they were trying to break in uh, to a lot of different locations. Uh, one of the things that intrigued me <coughs> was uh, <coughs> that when you read, when I read the Gemstone Plan, um, it talked a, a lot about uh, infiltration and breaking in, uh, to bugging and stuff like that. And then it had, if you recall, a description of a, a safe in Las Vegas, which was owned by Hank Greenspun, who happened to be the owner and editor of the Las Vegas Sun. And so at the TV recess, I decided to go out to Vegas and to find out why was Hank Greenspun, whoever the hell he was, why was he in uh, got a, a, a role as important as o Larry O'Brien's office at the DNC? Because they were all wrapped up in the same uh, gemstone plan. So I went out to see uh, Greenspun, and he said, oh, no, no, it had nothing to do with uh, the, they, the cover story is Muskie has a hunting violation in Maine, and I've got the documents on that, and that's what they claim that they broke, tried to break into my safe, <coughs> Hank Greenspun's safe. And he said the real reason that they tried to break into my safe, and there was a there was a, a documents that showed that uh, <coughs> that the uh, burglars that were going to go break into Greenspun's safe had arranged for Hughes to get him a, a plane to fly out to, out of the country once they got what was in the safe. What was in the safe was Howard Hughes's handwritten memos to Bob Mayhew, who was running the Hughes. Uh, Vegas operation. <coughs> so that started us out on a huge investigation. We, we spent days on, on trying to track down um, why they were looking at Greenspun's safe, and Greenspun was having a fight with, the, um, with Mayhew, or Mayhew was having a fight with Howard Hughes, and we finally decided that one of the reasons that they broke into uh, the uh, Watergate, the DNC, was because Larry O'Brien was also a consultant to the Hughes organization. And therefore, we were thinking maybe uh, they were looking for these documents and that uh, O'Brien had some information about all these other disasters, the horror stories, and they wanted to grab those documents out of the, out of the safe. Larry, I think that's too sophisticated an explanation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, at the time, uh, Terry's very talking, sophisticated. Talking to Larry O'Brien at the time, we speculated on that, but at the end of the day, we didn't think that was right. I would say at the at the time, obviously Larry O'Brien was chair of the Democratic National Committee, and right. Larry and I talked about this, and we talked specifically about that, but we didn't think that was the motivation. Either. But you talked about uh, about the Hughes papers uh, in Hughes's handwriting and all that. Not in that specific, <coughs> not to that level of specificity. But I remember learning from Larry that he had uh, worked for the Hughes organization at some uh -huh. point, and whether that could have been involved. But the idea that he would store papers relating to his work for Hughes at the DNC is improbable. Well, there were there were memos that we found that's uh, that circulated in the White House, saying we need to find out what O'Brien knows about some of the, the stories that could come out. And so we, we, we never locked it in beyond any reasonable doubt, I can tell you that. But to me, it was a plausible situation. And Hank Greenspan certainly believed it. He absolutely did believe it. Back in the back there. Uh, my name is Stuart Laurie, and I covered the uh, Nixon uh, White House in the first couple of years for the Los Angeles Times, um, and I'm on the enemies list. Um, <laughs> during uh, 1969, 1970, I was sure that my telephone was being tapped. I could hear the clicks all the time on my, my home telephone. Um, in the 19, and then I ended up on the enemies list, and my income taxes were audited twice. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in the late 1980s, I filed FOI requests with uh, the FBI, the CIA, the State Department, uh, all of the agencies that I could think of 
uh, for uh, information, records that I had. Uh, I finally got 76 pages from the FBI, uh, most of it blacked out, none of it relating to uh, any problems that the uh, Nixon administration or the Johnson administration had for me. Uh, the question is, is there some place that I can go to where wiretap records are kept uh, that I can find out whether my phone was actually tapped? Well, if you, were, if you were part of the process that they used with Joseph Kraft and the other newsmen at the, in the spring of 69, uh, no, because they were destroyed as being uh, horribly embarrassing. And they bounced around a lot, too. Uh, Hoover kept them at the FBI, and then they shipped them over to uh, Ehrlichman. Um, and, uh, and that was, uh, probably came up in, in Terry's uh, investigation at, in, the, in the Senate committee. So, um, uh, there were an awful lot of um, black bag jobs that were done. They were counted, but the records were kept in like separate files at the FBI uh, Bureau. And if I remember correctly from reading the Church Committee reports, um, they uh, were either sanitized or disappeared over time so that only the numbers um, remain, not the individual files. But possibly the, if you went to the National Archives and went to the Church Committee's raw investigative files, there may be more there. Uh, I think I'm being given the hook. Congresswoman, do you want to add anything to uh, to this panel? Well, I was very interested in Francis O'Brien's comments about Peter Rosenfeld. Because I remember Can you wait for the mic? The mic. Just to give you an idea of how uh, prejudice plays a role, or at least didn't play a role here, but when I was running against Emanuel Seller in the primary in 1972, one of the criticisms I had from progressive organizations and democratic groups was, oh my God, Peter Rodino is going to be chair of the House Judiciary Committee. And I can't help but think that it was just a matter of um, stereotypes and prejudice because he turned out to have done a magnificent job. Uh, that he did. Um, I'm being given the hook. Uh, this has been terrific. I hope some of you will stay around uh, and chat more about it. Uh, Jack and Terry and Francis, who uh, played such key roles in this, thank you so much. This has been fascinating this morning. And uh, uh, I, I, I still want to see what exactly was in Hank Greenspun's uh, safe. <laughs>